Wait, are we live? Are we live? Somebody put something in the chat if we are live. Let's see, there's five people watching. So let's see, somebody type something. It says, oh, I'm now live. Okay. Okay, somebody want to type something? You just want to make sure that everyone is hearing everything and uh, seeing everything correctly. I've never done a YouTube live stream before, so I want to make sure that everything is going okay. So somebody go ahead and uh, put something in the chat there. Or maybe we'll just start and hope that it <laughs> hope that it goes okay. Uh, let me check this here. Ah, good to go, good to go. Awesome, very good, awesome. All right, well, I am, of course, Tobias Murphy for Murphy Music Academy, and uh, I'm Brian Allen, his assistant of Murphy Music Academy. Yes, I I really thought you were going to do the. <laughs> we were but, we were rehearsing this beforehand, and he <laughs> and he kept uh, he kept messing up. His I'm also for, Tobias Murphy from Music. Music Murphy Academy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> the, the the way this whole thing, the way this whole thing uh, came about was, um, so I'm becoming very, very, very busy with teaching, um, and so I it became very clear to me, which is something that I always wanted to end up doing. It became very clear to me that I was going to need to hire someone to teach. Of course, uh, those of you familiar with my channel know that I have a very high standard for how teaching goes and technique is taught and all that good stuff. So uh, finding someone well, I, I normally would be very, very difficult. However, um, I've known Brian since our days at Cleveland Institute of Music, and we also ended up at the same school here at University of Michigan, uh, which he is still pursuing his doctorate. So we also happen to be roommates, and we also happen to have very similar views about uh, uh, violin playing and, and shoulder rests and all that good stuff. So it just fit. And so now he's my teaching assistant. So anyway, those of you who can't get lessons with me can't get lessons with him. But of course, I wanted to introduce him so more people would, you know, maybe seek out studying with him as well. And so I thought, well, you know, I should have him do a video like the way I do. And uh, he's not quite as used to doing that. And it was uh, trying to put that together was a grand mess. And so we ended up just talking he about the subject he wanted to talk about just normally. And we realized, oh, this actually worked a lot better as a conversation. So we decided we were going to try doing a live stream with us just talking about what he wanted to talk about and one of his uh, pet topics. And mm -hmm. yeah, we will just go from there and see how it goes. So Ryan, the main thing you wanted to talk about was intonation and not intonation in the sense of my video on how to fix 90% of your intonation problems, which is me just shilling for subject. Um, mm -hmm. But um, which was entirely based, which is most of my channel is based around the mechanics of intonation, which is, and this is something I've, I've certainly noticed a lot in teaching. If you get someone set up properly, if you get someone with the proper hand position and the proper, you know, not being too tense, all the right things you're supposed to do, they often end up just playing, even without putting like little guidance tapes on this. I'm talking about pure beginner students. They often end up playing um, in tune immediately. It's, it's very, very interesting. Um, they just, their fingers just naturally fall in place if you have the right technique. So that video on how to fix 90% of your intonation problems was, was based around that idea where you could just train in a whole bunch of motor patterns, which is one of the big things I like to focus on is, okay, let's just make sure we get all of our motor patterns efficient and in place. And let's do all that before we start trying to do anything fancy. And that really does end up fixing just most of the things having to do with intonation. But you have wanted to take it a, a step further because once you get to a certain point in violin playing, there actually becomes um, a bit of debate, believe it or not, surrounding intonation and how you approach it. Like we, what, what an interesting thing, um, a few months ago, I was uh, practicing the um, Isai 6 the Sonata. And um, the, this part comes in, hopefully I can actually play this right now, but it's been a while. At the beginning, you know, the, that third right there. Uh, I had deliberately chosen to play the B natural in that third slightly higher just because it's an unaccompanied piece and it just felt so nice, that really kind of high singing third. Um, and it felt good to me to do it. Of course, Brian then popped his head in from the other room. Is like, you really want to do that? 
Do you really want to do that? <laughs> Thankfully, at least I had done it on purpose. I don't know if that makes it worse. I had done it on purpose and I had made a conscious decision. I think it's better. Yeah. I think it's better, yeah, rather than not being able to hear it. Yeah, I had made a conscious decision to play that B natural a little bit higher because it just, it, in the context, I'm not playing with anybody else or I'm not going to match with anybody else. It's saying a little bit more. And it really did. I actually think by itself, that third just by itself saying, but Brian's a little bit, uh, a little, had, had a good argument, I felt. And he, basically said you need to play the B in uh, the B natural in perfect uh, a relation to the E, not just because, of course, it's you know, there's the E string on the violin, which you, know, you have to play in tune with the violin itself, but also the fact that it's in E major anyway. And so even though I did give up something from that very nice high, sweet, tight third, um, it I, I do think you ended up being right. So let's actually let you get into your subject on how you approach intonation at kind of that higher level where we could actually sit and have a discussion about, well, is that in tune or not? And here's my reasons for this, not just, okay, tuner says it's in tune, so it's in tune kind of thing. So yeah. anyway, shoot. Well, um, as Tobiah previously said, um, for much of our developmental violin lives, at least 10 years, maybe 15, uh, we are, all about setup and proper setup. And if you are indeed properly set up, then you can reach everything and it feels good and it's all pretty much in tune. The, the last level though has two components to intonation. And that is uh, your choice, where you put the pitch, which is what I'm mainly gonna be talking about today, and your consistency in getting there every time. Um, I feel that a lot of my students and, and even some of my peers that I've heard um, struggle with intonation not because their ear is less developed or, or because they're not practicing enough, but because they're not entirely confident that that's where the note should be. Um, so my intonation pitch tonight is, uh, <laughs> there's what is to give people um, a base of operations, a, a place to start with your intonation search. And this is beyond just the basic mechanics. Oh yeah. yeah, this is- This is, is it um, your ear, and it is sort of ear training. Yeah, yeah, I played for 20 years before I developed this strategy. And, um, and I, I owe a lot of credit to uh, a teacher I had in Cleveland called, uh, named Dr. Russ, Ross Duffin. Um, he is a legend in the period performance world. He just recently retired. And um, I actually took his class as a um, contentious opinion, as a dissenting opinion, uh, because my teacher, Jamie Laredo, played extremely expressively. He has such expressive intonation. But why don't you say. describe this for those of you who might not, some who might not be familiar, what, how would you describe expressive intonation? Or as some people yeah. might describe it, uh, playing out of tune with style. Oh, or purposefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you need so to explain that to us. expressive intonation is um, also known as melodic intonation. Um, it started uh, in the late 1800s as violin performers were playing in ever increasingly large concert halls. And their sound needed to project over that of the orchestra. Uh, so they started raising their leading tones and their thirds. So if I were to play a D major scale, yeah, I might, I might play a normal scale. Now I'm slightly lowering my pitches just so I can show you then. A high third and a high leading tone as well. And uh, if the orchestra is playing and you play, right, the type of A that wouldn't even match your A string on top of the orchestra, you're more likely to project. Now, this expressive intonation or projecting intonation at the time was in direct contrast to the prevailing intonation of the time, which started in the 14, 1500s when, um, when keyboard developers uh, 
were searching for ways to better blend their pitches. Um, there's a lot of documentation about how they uh, created different tuning systems for pianos. Now, string instruments could always blend and play in tune according to their preferences. Anyway, this projection's priority in intonation um, was well loved by a lot of people. And eventually that sound became sought after uh, in performances. So even orchestras themselves started playing in this expressive intonation. Um, I suspect it was also reinforced with the development of the equal tempered piano. Um, equal temperament has each pitch an equal distance away from every other pitch, which is by its very nature not at all expressive. But the sevenths, the leading tones, and the thirds are much higher than properly blended uh, versions of those thirds. So the, to maybe just kind of sum, summarize that and make that yeah. a little bit simpler. So the, the idea is, of course, um, some of you may or may not be aware of the fact that bef before Bach, really, um, keyboard instruments were kind of actually tuned to a specific key. Now, if you're playing something like violin, a violin is a chromatic instrument, not just even a chromatic instrument. It's like, I don't know what the, the term multi, uh, whatever that would be. It's like, we can shade pitches, obviously. I can play quarter tones. I can play less than that. Or, you know, I can, you can essentially choose wherever you want the pitch to be on any given note. And the prevailing rules of, of, of tuning at the time were such that not every fifth you would play, so the violin is tuned in what we call fifths, and we try to make those fifths perfect, but if you were tuning a keyboard instrument, not every fifth that you would play would be what we would call a perfect fifth. And um, where, the, where there was absolutely just no, um, no problems in the overtones when you played the fifth together, and the same for the octave, but not every fifth would be that way. And so if you actually tuned a piano in a certain way, you could not play it in any key like you could play a modern piano. And so what Bach did was come up with what was called um, well-tempered, well-temperament, which then later developed into equal temperament, where it kind of made enough compromises among all the pitches where there's literally no perfect fifths and no perfect octaves on any properly tuned piano that you will find. And, um, and so while you lose out on some of those very, these very sweetly tuned chords that were meant to fit within that uh, key, you, um, you get, the added flexibility of being able to play in any key. But now, of course, violinists have the ability to still play in that old intonation or play in the intonation that a piano is tuned to. And, um, and uh, so because we, have that, uh, because we have that flexibility, we can now do things like, as you said, make the thirds a little bit higher, make our leading tones. So if I'm playing a D major scale like you did, and I want to really emphasize going to the D, I might play the C sharp a lot higher. To really make the listener feel like they really need to hear you that gotta D. You got to play that D. That D. I need that. I'm not going to make the D joke. I'm not going to make it. Not gonna make it. <laughs> anyway, I feel like you really you know, need that to happen. Ah, so th so these is. these are these are options that you have as a violinist, and they're not always the best options, you know, depending on what you're playing. Because if I was playing with another a group of people, and let's say I was playing an A major chord, that C sharp would actually sound really bad, even if it sounded good in the context of the scale. So the real question is is not whether one of these tuning systems or ways of playing is better than another. It's how do we decide what we use? And that's really what we want to talk about. Yeah, I, I want to um, uh, show first that, that this, um, this idea of expressive intonation, which is uh, kind of what I'm arguing for. I'm actually arguing for a structured version of expressive intonation that I like to call Pythagorean intonation. Um, this is in direct contrast to harmonic intonation, what people would now call tempered intonation. Uh, what are the names? I, I wrote some of them down. Uh, out of tune, no, sorry. Um, the, the search for the blend, uh, especially in thirds. Yeah. 
there's the blend. The search for the blend is very harmonic based. It is old, old, 500 years old. And unfortunately, it creates really bad melodies and bad scales. So where do we go from here? We have to have a way to play a really good scale, but also be able to shift and play blended intervals when we need. So my proposal is that we base our intonation directly off what is called the Pythagorean circle of fifths. Now, the Pythagorean circle of fifths um, in any diagram you'll see starts with C and let's see, I'll mirror it. It goes up to G and D and A, E, B, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, except around this time, they switch it to A flat and then they go D flat, Etc. Um, so a typical circle. If it's anyone that's probably taken piano or music theories, you know, right, right. How to understand the keys? You know, it's usually you teach the keys. C, mm -hmm. C major, no flats or sharps. You go up a fifth. G, that's one flat. You go, sorry, one sharp in the key signature. You go down a fifth. That's F. That's one flat in the key signature. Right. You keep going this way, and that's typically that's how I was taught to learn all the keys. But there's a very interesting thing that happens if you do that in perfect fifths. Yeah. So. This equivalence, they call it, between A flat and G sharp is a lie. If you continue in perfect intervals, completely perfect intervals around the circle of fifths, if you're going up, you will not land on another C when you start on C. Instead, you'll land on a B sharp. And if explain you go down the circle of fifths, let's let's explain that a little bit more clearly. So the idea is is that if you follow the circle of fifths, if you go on a piano and you go start at C at the bottom, and you keep going C to G and you keep going up a fifth, you will eventually hit every note until you hit back get back to a C at the top. However, if you were to tune the and remember the piano, as we said earlier, is not tuned in perfect fifths. If you were able to actually tuned each fifth that you went to exactly what we call perfect fifths. So there's no problems going on in the overtones that everything's completely in uh, consonant and no dissonance whatsoever. The C that you end up with will not match the C that you started with. And that's what we're sort of getting. And that's what you're calling a B sharp. That's right. A perfect fifth is slightly, ever so slightly higher than the fifth on a piano. Equal temperament separates all the pitches equally and assigns numbers to them. Um, if you've ever heard intonation, now only like my conductor friends and, and other real classical music nerds have ever heard about sense in describing intonation. And I hadn't had any idea what they were until I took this class in Cleveland. But just to give some numbers to this phenomenon, an equal tempered fifth is 700 cents. A pure fifth is over 702 cents. It's like 702 and a half ish. So the difference is less than three cents, but over time it adds up. Uh, the human ear can usually distinguish about two cents difference. So it's just barely noticeable. This difference between a pure fifth and a piano fifth. <laughs> Because of that, if you take fifths around the circle, 12 fifths, and you multiply your two and a half ish by 12, we get a very real number of 25. That is an eighth of a tone, which is not very much, but it is completely noticeable. And um, it, it, the implications are, are huge. If you continue, um, around the circle and you add two and a half cents to each note, then you get plus 25, which is an eighth of a pitch. That's the difference between a C and a B sharp. C, B sharp. Now I'm using different fingers so that I can show what each of these notes would lead to 
in melodic or expressive intonation. A C desires to go to the B, while a B sharp wants to go to C sharp. Okay? So if we take this circle and go to B sharp, and then we also take a circle going downward and we travel into flat land and we go super flat until we arrive at what we would call a D double flat, which we'll never play in our lives, hopefully. Um, that is 25 cents in the other direction. So here's a C. And a D double flat, We again, we just don't talk about that pitch, but it would lead to a C flat, which is, let's see. So I'm playing it with a two because I'm calling it a C. So that's just not even a note, but the difference is real. And this is what naturally happens when we stack fifths. So my first proposal is that we have two Pythagorean circles of fifths. Um, that means nothing until I give it an application. I was about to say like, yeah. everything you've said has been extraordinarily complicated, and I hope. Yes. You know, so I'm here's gonna, an application. So let's actually get into it. Okay, so how does this yeah. apply to the average person? How can so they start deciding So as you really ascend the circle of fifths, the fifths get sharper and sharper and sharper, and so should our sharps. If you play an F sharp, you can think of it high and be right 95% of the time. This is what I would call ballpark intonation, which is actually like really high stuff because if we just try to hit an F sharp out of nowhere, then it could be high or low or anything in between. But if we aim for a higher F sharp, then I'm going to be really, really close to my destination, even without proper preparation, a lot of the time. And it's not just an F sharp then, it's an F sharp that's leading somewhere. You hear that the F sharp yearns to go to the G. Um, so I need to wrap this around, get it, and connect to the... Um, the other principle of playing the violin that is very important to us as violinists, and that is play in tune with your open strings. If you have a finger G, 150% of the time, it should match your open G string. If you have a D, okay, if you have a fourth finger A, then 150% of the time, it is right when it blends with the open string. Now, check this out. Not that I played it out of tune, but the E is under contention. Check this out. If I play an E that matches with my A, and then I play an E against the G, it doesn't match anymore. Now I'll match the E to the G. And it no longer matches the A string. If you've ever felt this, or perhaps with the Bs, right? This is the high B, and that's the low B. To match your D string, your B has to be lower than it has to be to match your E string. Well, let's, let's, why, why does it have to be lower, though? To blend. Yeah, I know. No, yeah, but mm -hmm. let's let's get a little bit deeper than that. So the I, the idea is, is, of course, it's coming from the chord that it's coming from, right? That, mm -hmm. That's the concept. So, and and this is something I think any violinist that starts to think about this runs into as well, which is that typically if you're playing a G and then a E uh, double stop <clears throat> with your open G string, what you are usually uh, what you are usually uh, framing is an E minor chord. Typically, mm -hmm. part part of an E minor chord, E minor triad. So, 
the relationship between a G and an E in the context of an E minor chord is going to be a little bit different than the context of an E to an A. And that becomes a problem with the violin where, because naturally within a given key, you wouldn't have the all of the fifths tuned in perfect fifths. So we have a bunch of arbitrary fifths really that are all tuned in perfect fifths. So in the context of people playing music, because obviously when you're playing the G string with your first finger E, that sounds a lot better if you play it a little bit lower, okay? What should you do in pieces? How, how do you choose which one to use in the context mm -hmm. of the music you're playing? And do you have examples of such music that would give you different context to play? That's a great question. Then? I'll have to think of some. The, the ultimate answer, and this is, my, this is my opinion, is that we can choose one of those Bs, one of those Es, to take into our daily violin life, and we can almost leave the other in the dust. And how do I go about choosing those at all? Well, one of them is a perfect interval. The B to the E is a perfect four, and the B to the D is a major sixth. It's not perfect. Now, we call intervals perfect because they, they appear earlier on the harmonic series, which is what happens every time anybody plays a note ever. You especially hear it with bells when there's other pitches ringing, it's in the harmonic series. Um, the fifth, the, the perfect intervals appearing first is significant because um, we, we would rather um, match with them than with a ma major or minor interval. They're easier to hear, they ring more, and they're also internally consistent to, to I think, each other. I think one, one side of this, though, would be that it's much, uh, something, a perfect interval that's off is much more unpleasant than a non-perfect interval that's off. So if you're playing a six, let's say, let's say that may, you know, the six with a slightly higher B, the... That's a lot less annoying to hear than hearing, you know, this. That was actually in tune. That's okay. the one. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a lot more annoying to hear the fourth being off than that's hearing right. the sixth being off. Yeah. So that could be part of it as well, is okay, if you're going to have to make certain compromises in your tuning, which very often you are going to make compromises, and this is why this becomes a, uh, a subject of contention. If you're playing right. a string quartet, if you're playing an ensemble, sometimes you will have someone that says, no, I want this to match this note. I want it to match another person will say, like Brian, I want it to match the, um, you know, the uh, the perfect interval That's uh, right. with the E string. So that would be an argument if you were going to be actually arguing about your intonation, which I said is something that you get to a point where you actually do, because it's not one that's technically right. It depends on the context. One of the arguments, as you as you said, that you would be making would be, well, a uh, if you first off, you have these notes that are unchangeable, the E, the D, the G, and the A. So we need to uh, first off match up with those things. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, matching perfect intervals with those notes is going to be a lot less is going to be a lot less hard on our ears than maybe not quite matching the notes on that are not perfect intervals. And that would That's be right. an argument that you could make for that type of intonation. Right on. Um, the other argument that, that I would make is that it matches up with beautiful melodic intonation. Matching with perfect Which intervals. Which we mentioned at the beginning. Right, course. right. If I'm going to play a series of perfect fifths completely in tune, let me first make make sure this is in tune. All right. Why don't you just play the beginning of the Barry Control? <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Good point. Good point. <laughs> but that only uses the open strings. If we put a, a fifth fifth on top of things, the B natural, then we have a B that actually does not match this open G. And I'll prove it. Okay. So I have a B. This is also the B. That matches here. So now I'm going to take that one. And 
I'm going to create this lo lower octave B. Now, I don't have to go through all these hoops most of the time, but I, I have this particular octave in my head, so I'm going through with it. So here's my B, and I match the G also with the open strings. They don't blend. The B that does blend... Yeah, that B is, now I would never want to start Bartok Concerto with, with that B, right? It doesn't have the same ring as the melodic version, okay? Okay, so... I feel like you, you, you've explained the idea of the differences between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would like from you would be a kind of more of a step-by-step -step guide to how someone goes about either A, finding mm -hmm. the proper note, and then where and when to use it. A yeah, a I, I'm sorry. I, I keep getting sidetracked by the, the examples I'm giving. So the f showing you the perfect fifth B as being out of tune with the G means that if we shortcut our intonation and we blend every note we play to an open string, they will disagree with each other. The notes we blend with open strings that are not perfect intervals, like the B here, and let's say if, we, if I'm doing just a D drone, right, or... So Playing that, with the drone gives me only partial information, and it drives me to an out-of-tune pitch. Okay, so so in other words, those of you practicing your scales with open strings or tuning to open strings, that's a great idea. However, it does have limited application. That's right. It gets you, as Tobias said at the beginning of the video, to 90%. But to get to the highest level of intonation, we have to recognize that not every pitch can be played with the same drone. The only drone that really helps us at the highest level is a perfect interval drone. So it eventually match all your perfect intervals too. That yes. Depending so on my bottom line pitch is, if possible, for the highest level of intonation, match all of your notes that you ever play to perfect intervals. And you can from your open strings. If your open strings are tuned to perfect pure fifths and not just piano fifths, but if they're tuned to each other so that they completely blend, then you can accurately and reliably tune every pitch you play to your open intervals because the circle of fifths, if we take two circles, is complete and it shows us every note and its fifth relationship to every other note. So if I take a D flat, there is a D flat on the circle of fifths if you, yeah. Yeah, and, there is, there is. And it goes in perfect intervals all the way to one of our open strings. It goes to the G open string. So if I want to tune a D flat on my instrument and I know how to practice fifths and, and I've been practicing fifths for years and I'm practicing fourths, so that I know how to execute them. This is the highest level, right? Then I'm going to travel upwards with my perfect fifths until I reach, and, and perfect fourths until I reach an open string. So here is a proof of how you can tune even a D flat to your open strings without using a direct comparison, which, which there is none. And we're there. All of those are perfect intervals. That's the most extreme example I could think of. If we're playing in a friendly key, it's so much easier. C sharp has perfect, C sharp is actually two fifths above B. So when we take this, 
we just make this a fifth and we have a ready to go C sharp. Now, for our viewers that have not already put 15, 20 years into the violin and practiced their fourths and fifths daily for years, I have another solution. I mentioned it briefly, but I'm gonna go deeply into it now. It's called ballpark intonation. And it's because we're aiming um, for a particular direction of our pitches. Um, F sharp is not just um, somewhere between E and G. F sharp is um, not just centered to itself even, but F sharp is high rather than low. And by aiming for a high F sharp, you can get it almost every time. And I showed you this earlier. Ballpark intonation can be applied to every pitch as well. Sharps are on the high side or sharps are high. Flats are low. Um, that only leaves our open strings, which I call anchors. When you have an open string that's an octave away from your note, you're instantly aware of where it is. When you have an open string that's a fifth away from your note, it's easy to find that as well. Um, the only notes that remain are C, F, and B. Um, so let's travel fifths away from our open strings and find out where those pitches lie. If you've also played viola, you know that the lowest string on the viola is a C string, which is even lower than your G. And so just as flats get flatter as we travel down from the Pythagorean circle, we know that traveling down from our G string to our C is going lower. Therefore, Cs are low. A low C can be found with this simple check. Our G and our open G. Sorry, I didn't struggle the first time. There it is. We can find a nice, ready to battle uh, low C just by that simple check. The F is even lower than that. F is actually just one fifth lower than C. And so if violists had another string below their C, it would be an F string. And I'm thinking of my open strings because I'm a violinist and because we should always be tuning to our open strings, but in perfect intervals. I'm just gonna reiterate that. So F and C are low because they travel down the perfect of fifths to reach them. The B is the last remaining note that doesn't have an accidental on it. B is higher than E. It's a fifth higher. And I've already showed you. Goodness. But this B sounds better than that B. And that's the higher B that sounds good. But also through checking our open, our, our perfect fifths on our open strings, we find that the B needs to be high. If you play with a high B, a low F, a low C, high sharps, and low flats, you are set for many years. And then you can come back to me again and we can talk about tuning every note in perfect intervals. Very nice, very nice. Could you give an example of how someone might go through that in a particularly well-known piece of music? Like, I don't know, something that maybe Mendelssohn or Brooklyn Concerto or something like that. Or Mozart. You can play Mozart a lot, so why don't you? Yeah. Let's talk about how you're how you're tuning Mozart in that case. Sure. Like a practical example about how you Yeah, so I, I study Mozart five a lot, and um, it's my my audition go-to. Um, the first note should match our open string. That's obvious to most violinists, but it's very real. If we also match the C sharp to our open string, it's low. So if we play an open string A drone, we're going to sound like this. And then we have to play the E high. 
And that's not going to happen. Right? That doesn't sound good at all. And what, what so, did you, which concerto is this from? This is Mozart five. Yeah, the beginning of Mozart's fifth concerto. Those yeah. famous, very slow beginning. Yeah, and yeah. and it just doesn't work to play the C sharp that low. It's totally, you know, it's it's a very normal C sharp, especially if you're playing a quartet. It belongs to the other school, what I would call the other school of intonation, which is harmonic intonation or tempered intonation. So that C sharp does not belong here in our solo piece. Sorry, Tobias. Instead, Checking the we want to choose a C sharp that blends in perfect intervals with the closest open string. That's a perfect fourth, right? And we could also be really um, honest about it and play. And then we can play our piece. That C sharp works much better. Now, how do we find the E? The E is simple. It's our E harmonic. And we can trust that harmonic because it's an octave away from our open string. It's a perfect interval. Per octaves are perfect, just as fifths and fourths are perfect. And they all agree with each other. Okay. Now we're going to have a new pitch. How do we choose that G? Well, that's actually simple because we have a G string to match to. All right. Now we're going to play a trill with our F sharp. The E is a simple choice because it should match with our open string. Where does our F sharp go? Well, the high F sharp, because it's a sharp, is the one that really sings. Now I'll contrast that with the low F sharp. And then I'll prove that that's a real F sharp that exists. Because it blends with your D string. So if you had tuned that passage just here, then your F sharp would be too low for performance. We want the high F sharp. Now that last one I just did by ballpark intonation. I said, I want an F sharp that's on the high side. And I got it. That's it. Okay. So would you like to uh, maybe demonstrate play, just playing straight through? As you have gone through that process in your practice, and that's the process you go through in your practice, maybe demonstrate how sure. you would play now the, the final product now, of being I do play that want way. to say that even at the highest level, you do not have to routinely check each pit, pitch it, with fifths. It, it becomes, it be, you start to hear it. After yes, a while. And, exactly. and your fingers kind so of this, learn not just how to lead, to, to sort of find the, and aim the right way, but also there's subtleties of shading and leaning the finger one way or the other while you play as well. Yes. So, so I said at quickly. the beginning, I, I touched on this, that at the highest level, there are two steps to intonation. And a lot of people who play out of tune struggle only because they don't know for sure where their pitch goes. This highest level of perfect fifth relation helps people to hear what the pitch should be. And a good tuner set on um, Pythagorean intonation or violin family would also achieve this goal. But once you know where the pitch goes, all you need to do is practice aiming for that pitch. And your ear is your boss here. Your ear will remember the pitch so that you can achieve it over and over again. So.
Lovely, lovely. Okay, well, have you said? I think I think you've bounced. That's pretty much it. Now. The problem with this type of stuff is like it's like trying, and this is why actually why I don't make videos very, like most at the fastest. I make them every two weeks is because it actually takes me a long time to figure out how to take concepts that usually take like literally months and months and months and years to explain to somebody and then try to turn them into yeah, a 20 minute a video. Craft, a cohesive so argument, yeah. that's, that's a big reason why it yeah. actually, I don't just turn out videos that when I'm busy. Um, but that, that's a big reason why. So trying to just come out and say all this stuff that honestly takes this long to, yeah, uh, I felt to a lot more comfortable, but but it is, is we very certainly difficult. got so hopefully off that the maybe, rails a couple times. Hopefully, maybe that actually just puts some ideas into your head that will germinate and you can experiment with. And mm -hmm. uh, even if you don't quite understand, maybe, you know, in a couple of years when you get a little bit more advanced, you'll go, oh, that's what those guys were talking also, about. Also, talk to us in, in your lessons. And, well, not all these people are our students. And feel free to take a trial <laughs> lesson with us, too. That's <laughs> a like, free advertisement. Sounds, I think some of these people yeah. might. I haven't seen my mom in the chat yet. She said she would watch. So, oh, no. Mom, if you're out there, you should comment. Anyway, let's go through. See, so there's been a few questions in the chat. I've tried right. to answer a few of them, but let's go through. So, all right. So let's start here first with uh, Delta 4, 12, 12. What are the things you wish you had known when you started learning the violin as a beginner? You had it pretty lucky, actually, to be honest. I had His dad is a violinist. Yeah, I had great training from my dad as my coach and also from the time I was seven. I started when I was three in a Suzuki program. But when I was seven, I, I joined the fast track. I joined uh, Indiana University uh, pre-college program. And if there's one thing I wish I had known when I was a beginner, the violin left-hand position is not actually here. It's here. Do you see the difference? If you come over like this to support your fourth finger, then your fourth finger can have an arch, an easy arch and the rest of your hand still feels great. I wish I knew this when I started playing violin. I was taught here, and so three of my fingers felt great and my fourth finger was left out to dry. And so for years, I played with a flat four, which is fine, but not really relaxed. And so over time, a flat four creates tension first in the wrist and then in the arm, which spreads to the chest and the body, and by then, it's traveled all the way to our neck and, and everything, and we're, we're toast over a long period of time. And we'll have to stop playing violin when we're 60 or something because of injuries. But, you know, injuries could happen with any sort of really bad technique sustained over time. Uh, anything that hurts, you know, can, can create problems. So what I chose to train just a couple of years ago is my hand coming closer to the neck here on the pinky side. That's one thing I wish I had known when I was a beginner. Well, for me, um, and it, it's kind of weird because I was like seven as well. And there's, it's kind of hard to say, well, what did you wish you knew when you were seven? Well, no, it's what I wish my teacher would have known or would have done. This, mm -hmm. That's really more what it comes down to. And I wish um, there would have been a lot more emphasis, two things, emphasis on motor patterns and um, just like drilling and having kind of a hierarchy of motor patterns that you drill in and also having a lot more structured approach to, to playing. So with my teaching, my, my philosophy uh, of teaching is two things. One, it's you need to break down all of the component parts so that it takes to play the violin and mostly work them into movements, especially for the first few years, and then just drill those movements in while simultaneously playing pieces because you need to, that's the whole reason you're here is to play music. But to, in order to have an easier time playing music, if you have all of the basic motor patterns in place, especially from an early age when they're just going to absorb it more, and you teach from that vantage point, it's uh, you're going to have a lot easier time than let's say when you get uh, you know do you start playing more difficult music and there's a lot of technique that you just kind of have to crash course your way through instead of if somebody had looked down you know a little bit of the corridor of time and said hmm if I you know do these type of preparatory exercises they won't have to worry about learning this thing or they won't have to worry worry about learning why is this not playing in tune because they didn't learn how to appropriately, you know, move their hand across the strings. The fingers aren't moving perpendicularly. And then you actually have to address that when you're, you start playing more difficult music, which is actually something that happened to me. I didn't, I didn't think as much about moving the fingers 
perpendicularly across the strings and even how to do that because often when you do that for the first time when you think you're doing it you're actually moving them diagonally mm. and that's one of the biggest and simplest um technical things to you can fix that people don't think about as much so for example mm. actually to keep the fingers moving straight across like so if you move your third finger from e string to a string you are moving it directly across this way you actually have to think of moving your hand back that way that's just the way the shape of the hand works out and uh that was something you know it seems obvious now but that was something i had to teach myself pretty late on like i just i was like why is my intonation suck you know why is it you know it's i mean this was i was already in you know music school at this point uh conservatory i was like i was playing i forget what i was playing it was pretty advanced stuff and i'm a good violinist but there was just little little things in my playing that i was just like why is this why does this not sound the way it is? Why do I do this so many times and I just can't get, get this right? Mm -hmm. So something in high positions. I think it was Prokofiev Sonata or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's and I, then I realized, oh, wait, I'm not paying attention to my fingers going perpendicularly <laughs> across the fingerboard. And it sounds so simple. But things like that to where, te and I teach, I don't just, I teach some little kids as well. And you have to be, as a teacher, you have to be on guard for that type of stuff. Because there's a lot of things, you know, you can get their setup, you can get them play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, you know, and on all that kind of stuff, and it sounds good, and they have good bowing position and good tone as, as they can with their little instruments and all that kind of stuff. But you also have to look at them and say, hey, their arm's starting to shift this way a little bit, or maybe their finger's moving in this way instead of, you know, in another way. That's actually, that's, this doesn't bother their music right now, but that's going to cause them problems later on if you don't fix it. And that kind of approach is something that I try to do as much as possible in my teaching. And also um, I wish had been done, you know, when, uh, when I was young, because I picked up a lot of stuff just by nature and then, but I had no mental framework for why I was doing what I was doing. I was just, Oh wait, I can suddenly play pretty, you know, pretty difficult stuff pretty well. Now um, aren't, isn't this cool? I'm the best guy in class. And then you hit a point where you're like, I don't understand anything that I'm doing. And that's when I really started to break technique apart. And I wish, you know, as great as it is now that I've done that for myself and I really understand it, because when you do that by yourself, you really understand it. Um, it would have been nice if somebody had done that for me right when, I was, when I was younger. And so that's, that's kind of something. It's not something I wish I'd known when I started because I was so young. It's just what I wish the people around me maybe mm. would have done but you know you can't you can't change that so all right let's Next. see let's see um let's see a lot of these are just comments what is more important bow or intonation i don't understand that i don't understand that comment what is more important brian bow or the bow or intonation well, i mean if you don't have the bow you can't tell the, the intonation that's a that's a great thing you know um the bow is often the focal point in our minds for the resonance of the instrument. You know? But uh, I heard once that good intonation is the foundation of resonance. And resonance itself is our volume. It's our beauty of sound. And intonation, good intonation, forms the core of that. And good intonation can make our bow more confident. At the same time, if we put a little more natural weight in the bow from our forearm and from our hand and recognizing the bow's own weight to produce more sound as well as coming up with our left hand, then our left hand can be feel more confident as a result of the sound that we're producing with our right. right. So they both bowing technique. Maybe yeah. that's what they meant. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think... Uh, they can both reinforce each other. Better bow technique makes us able to hear the pitches we're playing better so that we can adjust them quicker. But good intonation also reinforces that our bow feels it's okay to play louder. Something I, I would like to point out, though, is I think, especially in teaching, or maybe this was just, again, my experience, um, bow technique is the most neglected and the most difficult, mm. most important part of violin playing. And I think it's neglected not just by the teachers, but by the students, because now it's different when you're at a large level. But when I, when most, probably most people, some of you too, you watch a video, of whatever your favorite violinist, Hilary Hahn, Max Van Graaff, Yasha Hives, whoever it is, the main thing you're probably watching is their left hand. If you're watching, you know, 
uh, Vendor out a video of him playing Last Rose of Summer. You're going to mostly be watching his left hand because it's extraordinarily. He does all this crazy stuff, and that's really what you visually see when you play the violin. What happens in the bow is much more subtle, and that is why it's so much more difficult. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I think, takes a lot more time to develop. What happens in the left hand is a lot more... Um, what happens in the left hand is more a lot celebrated. more celebrated. It's a lot well, it's it's a lot more obvious. Uh -huh. Like you can watch what someone's doing in the left hand and kind of get an idea of what you need to do. I think even as someone who doesn't know as much, but understanding the subtleties of what's going on in someone's bow arm and understanding the difference between somebody that maybe you know is doing something that you should emulate and somebody that's doing something you shouldn't is not going to be as obvious. And so that's something that answer. takes the longest because it's mm -hmm. so subtle. That's what takes the longest to develop. And that's why um, all of my, you know, my teaching protocol involves a lot of just really basic. And sometimes, you know, I had a student ask me the other day, it's like, why are we still doing this bowing exercise? Because uh, they, they, they have it. Like, it's not a question of them being able to do it. It's uh, just because, you know, in your stage of development, this is actually something, it's just like something you just need to do every day. Eventually things like scales become that exercise for people. This is a person that's only been taking for a year. So we are doing simple scales, but it's not like the same level as, you know, going through the flesh book or something like that. But I said, you know, because we had to work so hard to get your bow arm to the level it is, and it was a real struggle uh, because this person broke their wrists when they were a kid, and so mm. they had limited flexibility. Uh, because we had worked so hard to get your bow arm to the level it is, I'm just going to keep you doing these exercises every day. And, and I understand that I'm just mostly in our lessons. I'm just going to hear you play it and say, okay, it's good. It was good last week. It was good the week before. But I'm going to have you keep doing it because in this stage of development, it's it's actually going to be a benefit to you to just have that thing you do every day and it just kind of keeps you up with things and the more comfortable you get with bow technique just the more natural it starts to become so um i don't know if i'd say bow technique or intonation either one's more important but definitely most <clears throat> people don't focus this on was a video anymore. on intonation thank you very much <laughs> it was now our teacher david halen uh said that the bow is 90% of expression compared with the left hand. And by that metric, bow is more important. I suppose so. Yeah, I suppose so. I and mean, because it's neglected, you it's couldn't, even more important. You now, next question. You do a whole lot with just your violin. Yeah, you could play half of God Save the King, though. <laughs> yeah, that's basically all you can do. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's see. I think a lot of this is common. Okay. Ba, 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 ba. Um, door intonation. Okay. Uh, I think I answered this one um, in in the chat. But Paling Sung asks, "What kind of?" This is more for me because this is what I do in lessons. Right on. Um, what kind of intonation system should we use when practicing Sevchik or Shradiak? And I answered melodic. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, your perfect intervals will blend. Your so, non-perfect intervals will not blend, and that's okay. So for, for any students of mine that are listening, obviously you've been in this situation where you've asked me, like, okay, when I do the septic exercise and there's a C, nat uh, C natural, so I like that C natural really low. It oh, actually, yes, please. It does not match up with the tune. Okay, and I am going to take my professional opinion and yep. say the I am tuner, right. If the tuner is set to um, to piano intonation, and it's, yeah. you know what we call ET or equal temperament. Yeah. Um, so low C's, please. In that be context. wonderful. <laughs> In that context, and ninety nine percent of your other contexts, there will be one C at the end of a piece that you play in your string quartet, where you'll play a higher C. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wasn't it? I forget. I forget who it was. Is a professor, uh, one of the chamber music professors at. Um, U of M, who said that they had the hardest time when they were figuring out how to tune the, um, and these are the actual things people end up thinking about, when they were trying to tune the, the actual tuning, just the strings of the string quartet that he was in for playing the American String Quartet by Dvorak, because the, there was a part in the piece where like everything matched up normally if you tune normally, but there's one part in the piece where like the, the low C string of the cello just didn't match up with the rest of the rest of the piece mm -hmm. that they were playing. And so he said it was actually, it was very interesting. It was a nightmare to figure out. Say, how do we, you know, how do we find the place where we can tune the C where it kind of matches up with both and doesn't offend anybody? Yeah. So like those can I be would, things I would have to talk about. I mean, I, I'm not a professional string quartet player. With that said, as part of my pitch, I advocate for open fifths, wide fifths in your tuning 
fifths that are pure and blend to each other. And that means a low C and a high E. They absolutely clash together. Oh yeah, that was that was the problem. Yeah, was and the so yeah. if the cellist wishes to match their low C string with the violinist high E string, and the violinist must play an open E, which is weird, because the violinist could totally play a covered E, and it wouldn't be a problem. They could play a lower the lower E that matches the G string, but if the cellist must raise, they can finger the, the beginning of that string and create the high version of the C, the one that matches with open E string. I forget what the exact context was, but I do remember yeah. it was very interesting. Okay, so um, this is an interesting one for you, uh, Brian. This is just a simple question. Have you heard of this book, Violin Mind Intonation Technique by Jensen and Kalinowski? Is that, um, is that Grigory Kalinowski? Is it? Tell me if it is. Uh, <laughs> it's it's Jameson, by the way, Iggy. It's it's not bourbon. Um, probably <laughs> will affect it pretty bad. All right. So anyway, but I Iggy, what, so uh, Grigory Kalinowski. Oh my goodness. Okay. So those of you who don't know, a big reason uh, Grigory Kalinowski is a huge reason why I um, have the view of technique that I have. I studied with him for three weeks. That's all it took, in um, hmm. at, at the Heifetz um, program, hmm. and uh, changed my life. Wow. So. I love hearing his I name have around not here. Heard my of sister, that book. my sister studied with him at uh, IU, actually. So anyway, but uh, yeah, I did not know he wrote a book on that, and I will have to check it out because mm -hmm. again, he he got my mind thinking about this stuff, and really set me off to where I am today. So okay, let's see here. Okay, talking about cats. Uh, and you also asked twist the left hand around more. So yes. Here's the uh, the position I was talking about that we're all taught as a youngster. Okay, have your hand here. But to reach the fourth finger, it's all about our priorities. If our priority is to make the first finger comfortable, then our hand can be way out here and our first finger's there. But then our fourth finger is nowhere to go. So the priority should be for the weakest finger, the one farthest away from our normal position. If the fourth finger is comfortable, then all the other fingers are still comfortable because they don't need as much help as the fourth finger. And one of the things I, this is why I love the Opus 1 of Sevchik so much, is because if somebody doesn't have a well-developed left hand, um, if somebody doesn't, it will develop your left hand because nobody has one thumb position to use all the time, okay? Whether you use a sort of the higher thumb position or the lower thumb position, I know I made the video on the high thumb position, but my default is this, okay? so. I'm going to turn around here. So if I'm just playing the first couple fingers here, this is pretty normal. But if I want to play the fourth finger, there's a little bit of a swing that happens in the arm. Thumb comes underneath a little bit. And that enables me both to re easily Excellent. reach the fourth finger without having to like do something weird. I actually can't do the thing anymore. Like I've trained my finger enough where you'll see mm -hmm. sometimes people's four fingers like collapse. I actually cannot do that. Mine um, collapsed for 20 years, so I can totally still do that. Okay, but <laughs> yeah. I can do it with, Not that it's a great can, thing. I can do it with this hand. But, uh, but this this flat fourth finger is, is often our default for octaves, but if we bring our hand around, then our octaves can have the arch as well, yeah. which feels so but, good. Um, but but in any case, doing those exercises, because they, they split the notes up, so you do groups of fingers at a time, it teaches you, okay, in this group of fingers, I kind of need to be here, this group here, and then it teaches you to seamlessly blend. And while I play, and I can do, uh, you get to a point where you do it without thinking. You just slightly swing the elbow back and forth a little bit, depending on what finger you're trying to leverage more. And you actually still, believe it or not, still maintain that frame, because it develops a very even and consistent motion. So. Yes, the left hand does twist around a little bit more for that. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Uh, does playing without a shoulder rest hold some people back technically? It could certainly be argued um, that some things are, are not immediately as straightforward, but um, this was uh, playing without a shoulder rest is the old school. Um, I, from the age of seven, have not ever used a shoulder rest. I've used pads, and I highly recommend pads for people who who wish to have some of that space filled so that they don't collapse when they play. And even I sometimes collapse when I play, and so um, it, it's a good reminder for me to lift with my left arm. But I, um, I advocate for no shoulder rest um, for your entire lifetime of playing because it's more natural. 
The other cool thing about no shoulder rest is you're forced to execute shifts the proper way. We are taught a certain way to shift, but if you're using a shoulder rest and you're clamping with your chin and your shoulder, there's really no reason to do those shifts in, in the mind because you know you can just jump around. But it's um, it's very unnatural sounding to jump around in such a way that you're leveraging here. If you're leveraging here and your left hand is holding the violin, then your shifts will sound more organic. Well, the thing, and I don't think it's, um, I don't think playing without a shoulder rest necessarily, necessarily holds some people back technically. I do, I'm not, I know I made the, the video on not playing with a shoulder rest. However, I'm not like a technic, I'm not against shoulder rest. I think they can be used properly. And I said so in that video. Um, I still believe that if they're used properly, the violin just kind of sits here. The violin also sits here. The chin just sits here and you're not trying to hold the violin up with, you're just using it to fill up some space. However, what I have noticed is, is especially with the students that I've started, you know, 10, you know, like seven years old, never played with a shoulder rest. There, there's aspects of their left hand technique that develops net way more naturally than playing with a shoulder rest than students I've seen um, that play with a shoulder rest because they're forced to engage the thumb more. They're forced to support the violin. There's a lot more may just natural understanding of the mechanics that happen. And so I, I, um, I'm a fan of not using them. And again, again, I'm not saying you can't use one or you shouldn't use one or, you know, it is, it's up to you. It's up to you. I do think there is a right way of playing and I do believe that it's not to hold the violin here, but, um, you know, as far as pads go, uh, it's very interesting. I read, reading some old books and stuff like that. Uh, Flesh was a big fan. Flesh was uh, Carl Flesh. He told, uh, he said, you know, you just stick something and unless you have a really squat neck, you know, stick something under your shirt put something on the violin. Right. Cause you know, it, uh, you do need to fill some space. I didn't start playing without a shoulder rest till I was 16. I, I only with... started when I was 15. Mm -hmm. I thought you said you didn't know I you were, like younger. I thought you just I took that. everything off when I was 15. Okay. I thought you said well, for some reason I, I was, was using thinking. pads for my first. Oh, pads. Okay. My first eight years from my, when I was okay. seven. And you're talking about using nothing now, but yes. not, not using actual shoulder rest. Right. Okay. right. Yeah, okay. Cause I, I think you said you never shoulder, shoulder rest. rest. Yeah, no, a little bit different. And of course, then you look at somebody that like Leopold Auer, and he said, you know, never ever use anything. Don't let anything touch the violin or dampen the. I don't really think that's that big of a deal. Um, obviously, if you can get away with it, then that's cool. But it is what it is. You know, do what works best for you. Um, that's Delta my Four said, "Love to play without the shoulder rest, but my trouble is the violin keeps sliding off my collarbone. That is so real." Um, now, I, for me, I have a pocket. I found a pocket where the violin balances perfectly. And I'm barely t touching yeah. it at all, you, and it rests. You should be but able to find people, a place where it can. Right. Some people don't necessarily have that, and especially with wardrobes. You know, people's shirts are made of different materials, and some people's shirts slide more than other people's cotton. You know, I, I use cotton polyester, whatever, um, and and it's it's fine for me. But for some people, you might need a sticky little pad some sort of sponge not for filling the space but for keeping the violin in place so that you can do what you're meaning to do i'm nice. just adjusting the lights here i'm oh, getting a little bit right. shiny there okay that's better that's better all right and then daniel asks uh, if okay. you could give a moment on finger strength finger finger strength finger pressure okay um as i said in my video on the subject uh, you should be using only as much strength as you absolutely need to press the string down. Right on. And I would add, and this in, in be... performance. Now there are times when it's actually good to practice with a little bit of firmer yeah. pressure, especially if you're developing your hand. And very often mm -hmm. there's a level of, again, subtlety in the finger that you cannot get if you are first starting and you just kind of have to press a little harder. And that's, that's just the case. But as you develop, as your fingers become more stable, and, and I work with people on this where we actually, this is a good time to use the tuner, by the way. You pull up the tuner and you put the finger down. And even if you think you're not moving the finger and the tuner dial is going like this, your goal is to get your finger to keep absolutely still so that tuner dial goes right in the middle and stays there for at least two seconds. Nice. If you can do that, your finger will start to develop that level of stability. And actually you can reduce the amount of pressure you put on the string. Because a lot of people jam their fingers into the strings because it gives them a better sound, but it's not because they're pressing harder. It's because it stabilizes their finger. 
So if you can stabilize your finger without well having to press that hard, mm -hmm. that is the way to go. I would add that at least at, at our age, after playing for a few years, we, we find that the initial action for the bow is the most important and the initial action for the fingers is yes. the most important. Absolutely. You might hear if we're if our mic's set up in a certain way, you would hear this action. But to buy it, don't, you don't remove, actually do that though. Could you remove my finger after? Look at that. There's a tiny bit of resistance. Yeah, very little resistance. Now the finger initially pushes the string down to the fingerboard, and that happens simultaneously to the bow. That action. Now you hear. I'm not doing right, and that's what Tobias was correcting that he doesn't want us, and it's a good reason to to press too hard because it's just not necessary. It tires us out. But there's an there's an initial action and an immediate release for the yeah. fingers. Yeah. And one one thing the thing that causes the best um, articulation is actually not necessarily putting a lot of speed like sort of kind of that kind of thing momentum into the finger it's how quickly does the finger get to its get to the spot that allows it to form a sound so for instance you can actually move your finger as slowly as you want to to the string which is a good way to practice actually doing this kind of very slow motion so you can kind of aim your finger a little bit but the moment right before it touches a string to the moment that it is pressing the string down so you can actually play a sound that is the important moment. That has to happen almost like instantly. And if you can move the finger very slowly and then at that last moment, boom, find the spot. And then of course, don't let the finger roll around after it does. Cause and I demonstrated this in my video too. Sometimes people squeeze and then as they squeeze their finger does this. Um, if you can find that spot and just have a very simple, okay, it's in. That's what makes the, the difference in articulation. It's not just slamming the finger down in the thing. You can move super slowly. And then even if it doesn't look violent, you know, just because sometimes people do this thing, very violent emotion, they can just, okay, it's in. That's where you get that good articulation and that good sound. So Kevin, thank you for clarifying your, your very vague question. <laughs> I, I enjoyed answering it. All right, really sick it is. Okay, all right. Oh, okay, um, Delta Four, I think I answered that question. I do have in-person lessons um, currently, but it's mostly Skype. So lessons actually happen here uh, at our place. And then I also teach um, in person up, uh, but only one day a week. And I almost have no availability there right now in Royal Oak, um, Michigan area. But I am planning on moving up there next year because that's actually where almost all of my work is ended up. So um, all of my Ann Arbor stuff will be left to Brian here. So um, I already answered that question. Daniel, I have not seen those Aaron Roseanne videos you speak of. I would love to watch them, but... I grew up with Aaron Roseanne's Sarasate recordings, and I love them. Well, one of my His favorite. so enchanting. Speaking of intonation, one of my favorite videos that I've seen the past year was that it was, it was an Aaron Rosen, but similar um, era uh, of, of, of character. Um, it's uh, Rodney Friend, his video, um, Tuning in Fifths. Have you seen that? I, you've mentioned it. I, it's I it's, really, it it's really interesting. Now... It, I almost feel like that's kind of something you need to grow up, like his view of the left hand. It's almost something that you need to grow up into to really get it. I messed around with it a little bit. But he had a very, very interesting idea of not just tuning the violin, but also tuning your left hand by playing. He's like, he basically felt like if you, and he actually suggested so, what he called softening the wrist. So not actually doing this with the wrist, but kind of letting it just come in a little bit. But playing on the pads of the fingers, of which I am a big fan. But he said, you should be able to play just about anything um, in perfect fifths. And if you are able to find the position that allows you to play everything you're playing in perfect fifths with that very kind of soft hand position, um, it'll essentially, you know, you'll essentially what he called tune the hand. And he had some very convincing demonstrations about it. I tried it myself. Again, it feel, felt like something that uh, you'd really just need to spend a lot of time that I don't have to really learn how to do, but it's worth checking out. It's very, very interesting. Albert, I love your idea of the raised oh, chin Albert. rest. Oh, Albert, this is one of my students. Nice. Um, my uh, childhood teacher, Brenda Brenner, is a huge fan of raised chin rests, and she advocates them for her students. Some of my peers growing up had really long necks, 
uh, and the raised chin rest was exactly what they needed. Um, you I have to use, make sure your case fits it, though. <laughs> good point. That is like so. I use thing. a slightly high chin rest, oh, but right also back. one that is just above the tailpiece, so that when I rest my chin normally and I put the violin to the side, I actually touch the chin rest instead of just blank space. Um, chin rests that are concentrated on the normal side and don't overlap the tailpiece have almost no, no help to offer us, which is very frustrating unless we strain our necks like this. So um, the way I play and was taught to play and the way I advocate for my students is to have your torso facing forward and your head facing forward and the chin rest becomes a jaw rest. I'm a big fan of the center facing chin rest because I actually want it to be a chin rest. Also, check this out. That's a raised. That's a raised chin rest. That yeah. sure is a raised chin also rest. Covered inside, so don't touch it. Okay. <laughs> does that um, does that fit in your case? No. Good to know. No. So if you have a, a raised enough chin rest, your life is going to get a little harder um, <laughs> because you might have to take it off when you go somewhere, which is not something I advocate because last time I was at a violin shop for pandemic. Um, they, they told me that, uh, they had specifically adjusted the sound of my instrument to match the chin rest. I don't know how important that was, but I think it's real. The, the sound of the violin completely shifts when you, when you take the chin rest off because it is a point of pressure on the instrument. Mm. Delta four. Okay. Which Michigan violin shops do you recommend? Well, if we're talking about student stuff, um, Char, of course, um, which is also national uh, shop. I've been buying stuff from them for years. But if you live around this area, they do have their actual shop here. They, um, yeah, they're completely trustworthy and they have very good and very affordable student violins that also have renting options. And then if you're going to be up um, more around the Royal Oak or Detroit area, Detroit Violin Company. Nice. Is that I have a lot of students that get stuff from them. Very consistent, very consistent, very happy with their instruments. Okay. Oh, this guy's got to go. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much, yeah. Daniel. And, All right. And we are done too, I think. I think unless there's no more questions. Okay. Let's give 10 seconds to see if somebody wants to get a question in. 10, 9, dun, 8, dun, 7, dun, 6, dun, 5, dun, 4, 3, dun, 2, dun, 1. All right. Dun, that's it. Hi, B. Okay. Yeah. Perfect pitch guy show up. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's it. Thank you guys so much. I hope we got, we did, we did something. I don't know. It was a little bit of a ramble at the beginning. Right. Yeah, it took a little while to get our to get our, our focus. But Again, but this we is fun. Never did a bunch I think of this things went well. Video I, and I think this went well. Know. It was really fun. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys so much. Oh, okay. Okay, Sabat. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's. We have somebody came get in, and this will be the last one. Okay, Sebastian, get your question in like really quickly. All right. <laughs> and we'll do it. We'll do it real quick. Okay. Somebody said it. Uh, well, let's get this last one. Migo. Uh, any method exercise etudes that can help reinforce your focus, the concepts you've demonstrated earlier. Well, Shradiac is an absolute pain, but if you train Shradiac with, Shradiac with, with your hand favoring your pinky here, and if you train with exaggerated half steps and exaggerated whole steps, so the, the fingers that are supposed to be together are really together, and the fingers that are supposed to be apart are really apart. It's not how Shradiac naturally falls. Shradiac naturally would fall with a lazy hand and actually train bad intonation because of it. So we want to be really active in our left hand when we play Shradiac and yeah. SFJ. Yeah, yeah. So that's the best thing for, for that. But as far as the other stuff is more about ear training, really. And just, um, yeah, check things with open strings. If you're not playing double stomps, play all your sharp sharp and your flats flat. And uh, maybe do some stability intonation work with a tuner. All right. When am I? Oh, that's what he wanted to ask. When are we doing this again? I don't know. When are we doing this again? Next month, maybe. Next month. That sounds good. That sounds good. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are off. I am going to go have some more Jameson and call it a night. All right. Have a good one. Oh, I know. See you next time. That's what I did. That's right. No pleasure, mediocrity. See you next time. <laughs>